God. Uh, minor casualties taking the farmhouse. Twenty dead or wounded, mostly wounded. Morale is fine, the men are steady. Captain Stanton muttered to his aide as he wiped the sweat away from under his shako. All right, get that off to command. And you, fill this back up. He waved his hand towards the young aide who turned and sped off towards his horse. Another young aide took the captain's canteen and proceeded to top it off with brandy from the company's stores. Stanton's company of some two hundred soldiers were milling about under a small cluster of trees, some lying down, others relieving themselves, and a few men tending to light flesh wounds they had received earlier in the day. The air reeked of gunpowder and blood, and the constant firing of cannons concealed the sound of a messenger riding hard towards the company. Where's your commanding officer? The messenger yelled to a cluster of soldiers who were sat around, adjusting the primers on their muskets. Captain Stanton strode towards the messenger, replacing his hat and offering the man a salute. You're the captain, then? The man barked. Aye. Status? Just sent off to command. Are you fit to join an assault? The French line is falling back, and the third hill, the general has ordered an assault to dislodge a battery of twenty-fours. The messenger shouted out, competing with the shouts, cannon, and cries of the battlefield. He was waving his right hand wildly about, pointing to a ridge line not far from when the men were conversing. Minimal casualties. We're fit, Stanton shouted in reply. Grant, be off. Assault's already underway. Written orders, if you need them, the messenger yelled, and handed a folded-up slip of paper out towards the captain. Up and at him, boys. We're going in again. Bayonets on. Stand to. Let's go. Stanton began to yell as he walked away from the messenger, who was galloping off back to where he had come from. The company began to rush about, and in under two minutes they had dressed the line and were facing towards their target. Captain Stanton had taken up his position on the left side of the formation and laid his sword onto his shoulder. He turned and nodded to the company musicians who struck up the British Grenadiers, and the company began to advance in step with the music. Let's hear a song, boys! Stanton cried out, and the company responded with the opening of the march. The singing faded into the background as the company drew close to their target. The rumbling roar of the cannons made Stanton's ears ring, and the beating drums and shrill flutes of the companies that had fallen in next to his confused the melody of the song. A battery of horse-drawn twelves was trying to form up to Stanton's right, but were taking heavy fire from the French battery on the hill, which was proving to look a promising target as the French companies were being drawn off. Stanton's men were on the furthest right of the line, and perfectly lined up to storm the battery while the companies to the left pinned the French line in place. His heart began to beat rapidly as the lines drew closer to one another. He had soldiered for some twenty years, but the closing of two lines never failed to force a prayer and thoughts of home into his mind. A deafening crack broke out in Stanton's left ear, and the cries of wounded were sent up to heaven immediately following. The lines on his left had closed. The French battery was still focused on the English Twelves, and Stanton's men began to ascend the hill. Not until you see the whites of their eyes, boys, Stanton screamed out, and the order echoed down the company line. The redcoats drew up at an angle to the battery, and Stanton called the company halt. The front line dropped to knees as the two facing lines aimed their muskets forward. Drifting smoke from the battle had begun to obscure the battery, and if they didn't fire now, the volley may prove useless. Aim! Fire! The crack of muskets rang out all along the line. Stanton drew his pistol and pointed his saber towards the battery. Forward! He cried, and the line broke as the company rushed forward with bayonets down. Stanton ran into the smoke that had enveloped the battery and began coughing as his eyes began to water. He knew he was running in the right direction, and the flashes of red in his peripherals and the cries of God save the king let Stanton know he was still with his company. Suddenly, from the smoke in front of him reared up a sandbag wall, and above it a single twenty-four that had been wheeled around to face the advancing redcoats. Behind it stood a single wounded artillery officer, an inch away from touching fuse to powder tray. Down! Stanton yelled, more to himself than to anyone else. His heart sank and his mind raced. Time slowed to a crawl as the fuse was touched off and the black maw of the cannon roared to life in a flash of blazing fire. Everything went dark.
pain was the first thing that Stanton felt as he came back around. His shoulder and his whole left side were burning with the fires of hell, and he opened his eyes slowly. It was dark, with only the faint glow of the moon lighting the night sky. It smelt of blood, of death, of burnt and mangled flesh, a cacophony of moans and groans, punctuated by screams and faint crying assailed Stanton's ears, which still rung. He lifted his head slightly and saw that his left sleeve had been cut away and some rudimentary field dressings had been applied all over his left, his shoulder, his arm, and a few here and there on his leg. He tried to move his left arm, but all that came of it was more searing pain. His arm was all but useless. Stanton gazed further and saw the gentle light of the moon illuminating piles of corpses and shot through flags everywhere around him. The battle was over and he was left behind. He groaned and let his head fall back onto the blood-soaked grass beneath him. A quick prayer and thoughts of home filled his head again, and he uttered the Lord's Prayer to himself. He tried his right arm and found that it still worked. It didn't hurt. It seemed he had only been hit on the left side. From the number of wounds, he'd assumed he'd been grazed by a canister of grape. He knew from experience his odds weren't good. He shunted himself onto his right side and looked behind him. A dead artillery horse was collapsed on the ground a few feet behind him, laying against a wall of mangled sandbags. The corpse of a French officer was slumped against the horse, and blood was spattered across his white shirts. Stanton attempted to pull himself with his one working arm towards the horse, so he at least had something to lean on and found the effort tremendous. His left side was dead weight that screamed with any movement or pressure, but he managed, after some five minutes of crawling, punctuated with cries of agony and breaks to wipe sweat off himself, to reach the horse and prop himself against it. He leaned back and found the horse to still be giving off the faint heat of life that was slowly seeping from it. He gazed up and investigated the thousands of stars that stared down at him, still and unmoving. You're lucky the canister was faulty, you bastard. A hoarse voice mumbled from Stanton's side. The corpse was alive. I thought you were dead, Stanton said as he fumbled for the canteen of brandy at his side. Don't suppose you're willing to share? The corpse asked. Stanton took a long drink from the canteen and sighed as the burn of alcohol turned into a welcoming warmth that spread throughout his body. He stuck out the canteen to the man, who grasped it with trembling hands and took a long draught. I don't know many Frenchmen who speak with Irish accents, Stanton said as he accepted the canteen back. Les jeunes Irlandais crossed over to fight the English. Officer Kelly, if it matters who you share a last drink with. Stanton. The two men fell silent as the sounds of the dead and the dying washed back over the pair. Your lads ran me through right after I got that final shot off, Kelly said, reaching out to request the brandy again. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid that tends to happen between opposing armies, Stanton replied, handing the canteen over. Still makes you a bunch of bastards. Do you have family at home, Kelly? Stanton said as he took another swig from the canteen. I, wife and a son... <coughs> Haven't seen them in years, though. God knows where they are. I got chased out of the country for being a rebel. Ended up taken in by the Frenchman. <coughs> <coughs> I have a wife as well back in London. We're, <coughs> We're expecting our first quite soon. You think a man with an arm full of grape is making it home? I can do nothing but hope. I lost hope a few hours ago. I'm well done in at this point. <coughs> Here, uh, let, t let me take a look, Stanton said, and he shuffled himself slightly towards Kelly, his arm burning all the while. Kelly's left hand was holding a fat wad of blood-soaked gun cotton to a nasty, sputtering wound in his stomach. Nasty business, those bayonets. You're telling me? 
Well, I can at least dress it fresh. Would you have a knife? Left boot. Bring a knife in there. I'd fetch it for you, but I'm a bit indisposed. (coughs) Stanton leaned down and pulled the knife from Kelly's boot. He hoisted himself halfway onto the dead horse and cut a long strip off the saddle blanket before slumping back down next to Kelly to regain his breath. Uh, Now then, can you lean forward? Aye. Ah! Ah. Kelly moaned and leaned forward, letting out a sharp cry of pain as Stanton tightened the cloth around his midsection. Stanton held the brandy to Callie's mouth, who took another drink before slumping back against the horse. Never thought I'd thank the English for anything, but thank you. (laughs) Uh, Anything for pleasant company. The two men sat in silence for the next quarter hour or so, finishing the canteen of brandy between them. I don't suppose if you survive, you'd be making your way to Cork any time. Uh, unlikely. Is there something you'd like me to send to your wife? My... my son. I just wanted... I, I, I just wanted him to know his pa loves him. I was looking down on him. Uh, yes. His name? Sean. Uh, well, Sean Kelly, I... I can remember that. I'll, I'll write a letter if I if I have the chance. Thank you. <laughs> I'll I'll tell him I'm the man that uh, his father shot with a cannon. <laughs> I don't suppose you sing it all, do you, Stanton? Well, I I know a song or two, but I. I wouldn't call myself a singer. Oblige a dying man, would you? Very well. Stanton said, and made himself as comfortable as he could against the dead horse. He looked at Kelly, then up into the magnificent night sky, and Stanton broke the symphony of the dying with his voice as he sang. <laughs>